We're going to get started. Yeah, would be one. Really exciting, exciting talk today. Um, this you. is our last aggregate noon for the semester. Um, so just at the beginning here, I'll wish you all happy holidays and tell you how much we will be looking forward to seeing you in January. <laughs> Um, and I'm going to pass the mic to my colleague from African culture, like. is Professor Matt Brown, the, the author of really mm -hmm. subjects and just a brilliant colleague, oh. like does so much for the department um, and also for our program, including inviting today's speaker, Professor So I'm going to ask Matt to introduce you, introduce Professor. Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome. It is such a pleasure. This is really fun to introduce uh, a really, really good close friend. Uh, today's speaker, Lindsey Green Sims, is, um, is someone I've known since graduate school. Uh, the first time we met was at a conference in Illinois when Nollywood and African Cinema Studies was kind of new. And I was a grad student and I was just wide eyed and bushy tailed. And Lindsey was a presenter there. She was working on her dissertation at the time. Um, and you know, we struck up a conversation then, and we have been friends ever since. I think that was in 2007. The dissertation she was working on at that time became her first book, Post-Colonial Automobilities, which is an excellent book that um, I definitely encourage you to seek out. It's about car culture in West Africa, but especially its representation in literature and film. And I want to note that it won the African Literature Association's highly esteemed, incredibly important and influential. The winners of this award go on to do great things. Um, <laughs> best first book award um, in, what was that, 2017, 2018? The book came out in 2017. Um, right. um, you know, uh, the next time that we really interacted substantially was in Lagos, Nigeria, when Lindsay was doing work on Nollywood. Um, and she was especially interested in melodrama and gender and sexuality and queerness in Nollywood. Um, and we bummed around to all the usual places. I piggybacked on an interview she had with Tunde Kehlani at the time, you know, um, and the research she was doing then turned into a really important work on melodrama, which I'm glad she's going to be talking about today, as well as queerness in Nollywood and in African cinema, African cinema more broadly. Um, some of those things that I've taught in some of my classes and some of my students might know. Um, more recently, you know, Lindsay published this new groundbreaking book, Queer African Cinemas, with Duke University Press that promises to be field defining, I think. It engages with films from all across the continent, as well as the different kinds of industries, institutions, film festivals, activists, organizations, and other structures that are both affordances for the representation of queerness in African cinema and constraints. Lindsay is also a very fine, you know, she comes out of a um, literary studies background like I do, and I think she's a very fine reader of audiovisual content and the ways that in this particular case, they index all of the possibilities and precariousness of queer life on the continent. It seems impossible to me that any future study of the represent, representation of queerness in African cinema can proceed without passing through Lindsay's very um, groundbreaking work. Today, Lindsey Green Sims is professor and chair of the Department of Literature at American University in Washington, DC. She's published articles in Camera Obscura, Transition, Journal of African Cultural Studies, Journal of African Cinemas, Journal of Postcolonial Writing, and has chapters in Viewing African Cinema in the 21st Century, which came out of that conference, um, and a book called Indiscretions at the Intersection of Queer and Postcolonial Theory. Lindsey Green Sims is a major figure in African culture and literary studies, and we're incredibly important incredibly fortunate to have her here with us today. Please help me welcome her to it. Um, thanks so much for that intro. How's the mic and the sound? Are we good? All right. Um, thanks for that incredibly generous introduction and a wonderful trip down memory lane as well. Um, so I wanna thank uh, Professor Matthew Brown for inviting me here. Um, uh, Kevin um, Wamala, Wamala? Um, and all of those involved in um, coordinating and organizing, um, and for all of you for joining in what I know is a really busy time of the, of the semester. Um, so what I want to do today is to talk about the origins for the book. Um, yes, there are a lot of close reads in the book, but um, I, what, I, what I always enjoy is hearing people, like hearing how ideas came to people. And so when I was thinking about what I wanted to do today, I thought, 
rather than going into you know one particular film or close read and I'm but I'm happy to talk about it. if there's a film that people have seen I'm happy to talk about it in the Q&A but um I really like I like we're all we're all writers and we're all thinkers and so I always like hearing about people's writing and thinking process and so that's really what I'm going to emphasize today especially in the in the first half um and then what I'm going to do in the second half is to think about um uh this was, this was the I, Kevin came up with the title <laughs> I was being a I was being a wavered in my tea and I hadn't given him a title yet. He put this in and I was like, and he's like, but I need your actual title. I was like, no, but I like your title. <laughs> I really like this. And because what it kind of the reason that I liked it is what it prompted me to, to, to kind of think about emphasizing um are the very two different types of films that I look at in the book. And that is also part of like part of the process is like trying to figure out how to write about um, both these art films, um, these like kind of, you know, a lot of them were Francophone, but not not so much anymore, but these art films um, alongside the popular melodramas and thinking about these films together. And it was really this challenge that actually led me to the, the main argument. Um, and also actually that was the focus of that conference where Matt and I um, met. It was about like art films and Hollywood films, but the debates that we were having at that point in 2007 were very different. Um, you know, those were like, oh, these are two different types of films. And so at that point to have a book, you know, that that talked about both was was not really it wasn't it was not on the table at that point. People did one or the other um, and they were kind of two different camps. Um, so um, so eventually what I'll what I'll do is I'll I'll go through the different chapters and talk about how I came to my main argument um, and thinking about um, how I think about um, resistance in all of these different types of films. Um, so before I delve too, too much into it, um, I want to start with a brief note on terminology and the title of the book. Um, so the book is called Queer African Cinemas, and I want to just mention that the word queer isn't really a, a perfect word. Um, and it also, I just also want to note that it's not always the word used by LGBTQ plus um, people on the continent. Um, however, um, like many scholars and many scholars and activists on the continent, um, I've kept the word um, because it's it's capacious. It includes a lot, um, and it doesn't presume a particular identity in the way that words like gay or lesbian do. Um, and often it points to different um, different ways of thinking, different critical possibilities and ruptures. Um, it's also important to know that queer Afri though I call the book Queer African Cinemas, um, queer films in Africa aren't always made by queer directors. Um, and actually most of the films that I discuss aren't. Um, and they're not always made for queer audiences. And again, most of the films that I uh, discuss aren't necessarily made for queer, queer audiences. And this is really different um, than, um, you know, one of the things that I had to do is read up a lot about global queer cinema. Um, and a lot of that stuff didn't actually make it into the book, um, but it did in the sense that like, I had to situate what I was doing in a way um, that was really specific. And so globally, it's often the case that queer films are made by queer directors and for queer audiences. Um, and so that wasn't the case. And, and in fact, some of the films that I'll talk about, and this is part of that project of kind of thinking things together, um, some of the films that I discuss in this um, in the book would be considered anti-queer films. Um, so again, I use the word capaciously and think broadly about how, how all of the films and videos, um, which are all included also in my capacious understanding of the word cinemas, um, uh, how they how they might fit into categories. So um, a lot of unpacking. I could also unpack the word Africa, but in an African studies um, <laughs> discussion, I, I will just kind of leave that as uh, as it is. Um, so anyway, um, the film, the I'm sorry, the book came about um, really um, actually very gradually and um, and unexpectedly. Um, so in 2007, um, I was in Ghana and I was doing research for my dissertation, um, which became the book Postcolonial Automobility. Um, and because the book uh, was on cultural texts like films and novels and music videos, I was really interested in just learning about Ghanaian cinema. I mean, there wasn't really, the 2007, again, there really wasn't much written about, the, about it at the time. And so I was um, interviewing a Ghanaian filmmaker named Socrates Afo, um, who a friend of mine at Minnesota had put me in touch with. Um, and Safo was this, he was just an amazing guide, an incredible, prolific filmmaker. 
Um, and he offered to take me around um, and to show me his different filming locations. And, you know, again, I was just, I, I wasn't necessarily like a film, thinking of myself as a film scholar, but I was kind of there like learning and observing. Um, and so I was really excited about this. And um, and so we're in his, his minivan and he, like I said, he's really prolific and he's also very, so to be a prolific filmmaker, um, you have to you have to be very practical and efficient. And so he had in the front of his minivan actually a little TV and VCR and he would watch and edit films on the go and oftentimes in in traffic in both <laughs> and in Accra. Um, and so he um and so he asked me if I wanted to watch the one film that like her name, Br Brigitte Meyer, for that, anybody who's, who studies popular culture will probably know Brigitte Meyer. Brigitte Meyer had written about one of his films. And so he assumed because I was like a Western scholar, I would also want to watch this film. So he asked me if I want to watch this film. And I'm writing a book about cars and traffic and films. And he asked me if I want to watch a film in his car and traffic. And I'm like, yes, <laughs> yes, I do. It was it was amazing. Um, I was like, there's so many there's so many ways that I, that I can think about this. And so the film that he showed me, I knew nothing about the film and I didn't actually um, I, I didn't know this particular film and I hadn't read that much about him um, either because I was really like just kind of in this like I'm learning I'm very like green and learning about things so the film he showed me was called um, Women in Love and it's about a woman um, who wants to become wealthy but doesn't know how to go about doing that so her friend offers her a way in and that way you join a, a cult worshiping the water spirit, Mami Wata, uh, a mermaid spirit, a West African mermaid spirit associated with wealth and also I discovered fluid sexuality. Um, so by joining the cult, you're guaranteed riches. But the catch is that once you join the cult, um, you'll never be allowed to sleep with a man again or else you'll go mad. Um, and so the cult members must only sleep with other women. And um, the way, you know, so what happens is you basically you, you gain wealth, but you give up your, your ability to reproduce, right? So it's, it's about like um, queerness being um, about ending, right, repro human reproduction. Um, and um, and uh, it was very, <laughs> very interesting film. So since then, I mean, I, I had, was just, so since, since that moment, I've seen many films that have similar plot lines or that are, the, you know, the 419 films that get, you know, the scamming films about accumulating wealth. But at that particular moment, again, I was still a grad student. I really did not have any way to process this film that I was watching in a car in traffic. And so, um, and so I didn't know where, where, really where to begin. And so I asked Sapo, Sapo a bit about like, the motivation for the film and he told me that it was a true story um, and he told me that if I noticed a woman driving a Mercedes in Accra it was because she had joined a Mami Wata cult um, and um, and that it was also he also told me that this film was was really proud of it it was incredibly popular um, in fact and in, in part because it gave people an ability to kind of understand these rumors and, and to see these rumors. Um, and he, he was really proud of the film, but he also um, had, was telling me how it was really, he was, he was a little bit embarrassed by the low production values. And so he was actually remaking the film because it was such a popular story. And in the years he made it, he had acquired just better equipment, better technical know-how. Um, so he was just in the process of beginning to remake the film. And the film that he made was a four-part a four -part film called Jezebel, um, which is a film that I later wrote about for the journal Camera Obscura and it became one of the main films that I wrote about um, in, in chapter one. Um, but again, in this particular moment, I, I wasn't, you know, I wasn't, I didn't know too much about it. Um, so this is, um, this is Jezebel. And um, I'll show, I was going to show I'll show the clip of um, uh, the scene where uh, it's called it's the initiation scene where um, the woman who wants to who wants to become wealthy um, goes to the the ocean and you know meets the Mamiwata figure and is a little bit like you can see kind of like um, perplexed and scared. Oh, 
it worked in our trial run. <laughs> <laughs> of course. Let's see if I can just, here we go. Yeah, yeah except for. Um, I could just, here we go. Okay. No, I've got to get it. Sorry. <laughs> Let's see. I can just, I can't really see the screen there well enough. There we go. Um, oh, except for question. That's okay. I'll be okay. So the cross didn't work. What's that? The cross didn't, the cross didn't work. No, the cross didn't yes. work. Um, so yeah. So so this. I mean, there's there's a lot to unpack here. That, you know, uh, I've got you know many close readings, but but the gist is this kind of so associated with this like false Christianity and evils. Um, and so um, also on this trip um, to, to Ghana, I had Sapo take me to the, to the market and I basically just like loaded up my suitcase with VCDs of any cover that looked like interesting. And um, I, you know, I came home and started watching the film. Again, this was for my book on cars and I was kind of interested in how um, they dealt with, with automobility. But what happened was that I, I actually stumbled upon several other films that had these like queer subplots. Um, and, and themes, and I was really surprised. So um, I looked for scholarship on the films. Um, I couldn't find any, but I found a, a, several films. I found um, you know, some of the early ones, Emotional Crack, um, Women's Affair, Beautiful Faces. Um, I looked for scholarship and I really couldn't find anything except for um, Brigitte Meyer's article and then a one article in, in The Guardian in a newspaper um, about Nollywood films. And the article was by a woman named Unoma Azua, who I then met at a conference um, and started to, to talk about. And so Unoma and I then really hatched this plan to, to do this research trip together. This is um, this is the trip to, to Lagos where, where Matt and I were bumming around. I didn't really think that I would write a book on this at all. I thought this was a really interesting article. Nobody's written on it. I have to figure out how to write about it. Um, and so, um, so Noma and I went to, to Lagos in the summer of 2010 and we watched a lot of films and we interviewed filmmakers and vendors. Um, we interviewed people who worked at the censors board. Um, that's like one of my favorite stories um, to tell. Um, we had a couple of watch parties um, where we invited um, queer audiences to come and watch the films and talk to them about their, their reactions. Um, what we discovered after watching a lot of these films is that there were basically three ways that they ended. Um, either the queer character would die, um, be saved by Jesus, or wind up in prison. And so, unsurprisingly, we didn't find a lot of support in the queer community for these films. Um, but it was really interesting to see how the films were were doing something that that much of public discourse wasn't, which was they were basically confirming that queer people in Nigeria did exist, 
And this was at a moment where it was, you know, it was being, there's always this tension where like, you know, homophobic legislation says queer people don't exist, but we also have to legislate against them at the same time. And obviously those two things can't make sense at the same time. And obviously they do um, nonetheless. So, um, so the films were, and, and a lot of the, a lot of these are main actors, um, right? Um, really like A-list stars. Um, and some some of whom are also rumored themselves to be queer. So there was a lot going on, right? You know, there was yes, these films were were negative in a lot of ways, but there was it was more than just that, right? They were they were putting something in the public discourse that hadn't yet been put into public discourse. Um, so um, let's see, sorry. So there were other there were other queer films at this time too. Um, they were mostly um, art films. They were mostly from Francophone countries. And the two main examples are um, Dakan um, from Guinea, a 1997 film about two teenage boys who fall in love. It's a really sweet, beautiful film. And then Carmen Gay, which is um, uh, it's it's an incredible film. It's a like it's an it's an adaptation of the Carmen story. Have any, have people seen this before? This Senegalese. Okay, um, this is a crowd where normally like lots of times I give this movie like I haven't heard of any of these films, but I was like maybe. Um, so it's this cinematic um, uh, ja Afro jazz adaptation of the Carmen um, opera, um, and in this version, um, it's the first version where Carmen is bisexual. Um, so these films were doing are doing very different things than the Nollywood films, um, but they were kind of. Um, almost one-offs, um, they were, um, you know, they were just these art films that kind of existed out there. Um, and then there was this whole body of, of Nollywood films. Um, but gradually that started to change. So in 2014, um, the Ness Collective produced a film, the film Stories of Our Lives, which premiered at the Toronto International Film Festival, but was banned in Kenya. Um, and so this banning, this kind of like international showing of the band which kind of got a lot of attention. Um, I was able to see this at a, um, uh, a film festival in Washington, DC. So it was very fortuitous that um, I was able to see this when it was when it was touring. Um, the Wound came out in 2017. That got a lot of attention um, for two reasons. One, because um, it was right after um, Barry Jenkins' Moonlight won the Oscar. And so a lot of people were comparing it to Moonlight, even though the plot is they're not there's nothing similar about the films but um i think it was a moment where you know black queer cinema was was being noticed and so that the timing was interesting um and then in 2018 um rafiki came out um and so and he was another is another kenyan film it's an adaptation of a of a short story um it made it to the Cannes international film festival but then was was banned and so this got a lot of attention as well. Um, I think even like Trevor Noah on The Daily Show did a bit about Rafiki, right? Um, so it, it kind of got quite a bit of attention. Um, so I was starting to think like, you know, as these films were, again, I did not think I was writing a book on queer African cinema at, at this moment. I was like, oh, this is kind of interesting, but I, but there wasn't like, you know, in order to have a, to write a book, you need an archive, right? You need, you need material. I, I just, for a lot, for many years, I was interested in this. But it just never, it just never occurred to me that there was a book, there was enough material. Um, in 2016, then I heard about a, a film festival in Kampala, the Queer um, Queer Kampala Film Festival. Um, I was able to attend that film festival, although I have to say that that film festival mostly did not show African films. Um, but it was still a really interesting thing to, to be at. Um, and so basically, you know, it was after the Kampala Film Festival that I was like, I think I'm writing a book on queer African cinema. And so what I, I had to do is I had to figure out how to actually, have, I had to figure out an argument, right? As we do, right? You're like, okay. At first I didn't think I had an archive. And then I, I was like, I guess I have an archive. Then what is the argument? And what the biggest challenge for me was that, you know, the bulk of the films were these Nollywood films, right? Um, the majority of these films were the Nollywood films. And what I had to figure out is how to put um, these films, the ones that ended in death and conversion and imprisonment in conversation um, with films that were that embraced queerness. Now, it doesn't mean that those characters actually had happier endings. I'll talk about that in a minute, but they were very different types of films. And I didn't want my argument to be good films, bad films, because that's not how I was really consuming these films. And I, I wanted to think about something more, more complex, 
complex. And so the more I watched and rewatched the films, the more I started to understand them all as participated, participating in various complex and messy forms of resistance. Forms of resistance that weren't necessarily about overt political struggle and that weren't even always forms of resistance that were progressive, right? Sometimes what was being resisted was what was seen as the international gay rights agenda, right? So different types of resistance, sometimes progressive, sometimes conservative, um, but kind of oftentimes like all combined and twisted into the different films. Um, and so um, I'll just read this quote um, from my from my intro. Unfortunately, that it's not on my screen anymore. So. Um, so I write, it has indeed been a challenge to put the types of films that queer Africans have largely found to be homophobic, films that often resist projects that make queer African lives habitable next to life affirming films. But it's precisely this juxtaposition that has helped me to understand how all queer African films, regardless of why they were made or who made them, invite an understanding of resistance as a messy process that entails both opposing and consenting to forms of power that involves fearing for the worst, but dreaming of the best, and that sometimes demands slow or imperfect forms of negotiation. Um, so I feel like that's the sentence to me that really that really captures the, the argument. And then I started to think about, so okay, if, I, if resistance is this complicated kind of thing, I started to think about, um, this, came, this came later, you know, in the, <laughs> in the uh, umpteenth round of, of, of revisions, um, I started to think about different registers of resistance, um, and um, but what I mean by that, I, I have kind of four different meanings of the, the term registering uh, registering resistance. So first, I mean, first and foremost, as I was thinking about how all these films are registering queer African existence at a moment when it is often denied. And so that's what I was saying too, a little bit about some of the earlier Nollywood films. They were saying like, look, there are queer people in this society, even even if the films, some of the filmmakers felt obligated to 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 end things. Um, have like punishment at the ending, but that wasn't necessarily like what the first, we all know what, what the first five hours of the film was, right? Um, so, you know, they were, they were registering queer African existence at this moment when people were saying, no, that doesn't exist in our country. Um, I also thought about registers as, as, as these like registers, like sonic registers as lower frequencies of resistance that are quiet or subtle, um, that are sometimes expressions of interiority or intimacy, right? So sometimes resistance isn't about, you know, marching in the street, but it's about these there's more private, quiet moments. Um, I also thought about registering resistance as something that can act in favor of power. Um, so understanding resistance is something, uh, sometimes this unconscious refusal to allow for something that will disrupt the status quo. So this is a, the, the more sort of conservative, like, I'm right. I, I'm reg I'm registering it in a different way, um, and then um, the last one is understanding the sometimes contradictory ways that films might register or make sense to different audience members. So, um, right there's not. So here's the, the example. I the, the example I give in the book, and it's really the example that comes to mind the most. Is I was talking to Jim Chuchu, the um, the director of Stories for Our Lives, which is very much, um, and and Jim is one of the few. Um, like few people, few out directors on the African continent. And so who's making this film that um, was um, kind of a docudrama of stories that his collective collected uh, across the country. And there was a friend and family screening and um, he, he, he was telling me how the, there's this one, it's a series of vignettes. And so there's one vignette about two schoolgirls who are in a relationship, um, but the, you know, the, they wind up getting suspended because they get, and caught kissing or something in the hallway. So Jim was telling me how at the friends and family screening, the, the mom of one of the actresses was like, I really appreciate this film because it shows the consequences of being queer and out. Like, like so I, I appreciate that the punishment here was shown that they got suspended. And so, you know, she was viewing this film almost as the, the type of cautionary tale that some of the Nollywood films are where that was not the intention at all. It was supposed to be this black and white film, it's kind of like artsy film. And so 
you know, that that was a moment in my research where I was like, you know, like I was saying, like the difference between some of the popular melodramas and the art films are kind of dissolving, right? Because they're being read and interpreted and, and, and they're registering for different audience members in different ways. You know, the same thing is like you go on message boards and sometimes a film that I would think, like a Nollywood film that I would read as homophobic, somebody else was like, I can't believe how many gay rights films this actress is doing. Right. So again, like I really wanted to make sure that I wasn't, I was kind of in, uh, accounting for all of this. Um, so I also, um, I was also starting to think again about resistance as um, the quote here is um, a more mundane, indeterminate and ongoing um, endeavor and something also um, that um, draws from rather than as opposed to vulnerability. Um, this kind of goes to that second thing where I'm talking more about um, interiority. Um, so I'm going to read this quote too, and then I'm going to get into some of the, the chapters here. Um, so uh, I wanted to think about what happens when intimacy, pleasure, small gestures of unwillingness, practices of survival and fleeing, or even of, ne of negotiation are imagined as conditions or resources from resistance. What happens when we see resistance not as the opposite of subordination and complacency, but as something that is entangled with it? What happens when we take seriously the framing of resistance as something that might be routine or vague, as something that hovers in the spaces of the meanwhile. My position is that when we disengage resistance from, a, from its progressive teleology and its binary relations to subordination, to domination, to vulnerability, we can better attend to all of the imperfect forms of adaptation, life building and belonging that more indeterminate forms of resistance make possible and that exist along the necessary work of overt and strategic political organizing. So I wasn't ignoring the fact that, you know, this political organizing needs to happen. It's just that the films were not really, this is not what these films were, were necessarily thinking about. Um, so the book contains four chapters and each chapter reads practices of resisting homophobia alongside practices that reproduce homophobia or that resist and otherwise to it. So each chapter reaches out to different sites to understand the multiple complexities and registers of resistance. Indeed, almost all of the films discussed in this book, regardless of their political intention, register the violence of homophobia as well as practices of tenderness, care, and freedom that can be resources for love and queer life building. Um, and so I'm gonna highlight the, the chapters really quickly. Um, so Making Waves um, is the first chapter and it begins by putting um, Sappho's film Jezebel, actually in conversation with Carmen Gay, and thinking about the ways that queer African cinemas can resist or interrupt the constraints of the present um, and also simultaneously reinforce them. So both Jezebel and Carmen are um, associated with their, their mommy Wata spirits in, in Carmen. Um, it's the, the local version, it's Kumba Castel, but they're both you know these, these mommy Wata spirits. And, um, and what I do with this chapter is to think about how Mami Wata provides a blueprint for indigenous forms of queerness um, and decolonizing forms of knowing that are impro improvisational, that allow for what I call uh, Afri-queer fugitivity. Though many other scholars use fugitivity as a way to articulate alternatives to and escape from the different types of enslavement and captivity that mark black life in the United States, um, this joins a growing body of scholars that think through black fugitivity in a global context. And in fact, um, there's a new book that just came out by a, a friend of ours, Matt Omelsky. Um, what's the, the title is, the whole book is about, is about global black fugitivity. Um, yeah, we don't remember the title, but Matthew Omelsky, it's a, it's a new book. Um, and, um, and so, you know, I, there's this move to start thinking about fugitivity in a, in a broader, broader context. Um, so in For African Cinemas, I, I point specifically to an Afro-queer fugitivity, um, an African and queer fugitivity that inhabits a certain slipperiness. Um, uh, and so the Mami Wacha figure helps me think through this. Um, the dreams of lives unencumbered by state sanctioned homophobia that breaks or evades rules and that flees from constraints by mobilizing past, present and future imaginaries. Um, and I also work, um, to with um, uh, Saidiya Hartman's concept of waywardness, um, this idea of kind of 
fleeing constraints, but also acknowledging them. So again, I'm not getting into all the close readings here. I can talk about any of them more, but I'm, I'm just trying to give an argument, uh, an overview of the different, um, the, the kind of focus of uh, how I focus on resistance in each of the, the different chapters. Um, so this is a chapter on, on Nollywood um, and it's called Touching Nollywood from Negation to Negotiation in Queer Nigerian Cinema. Um, and so if the practice of what I focus on in chapter one, the, the type of resistance is, is focused on waywardness or what I call this queer eccentric um, eroticism. Um, and chapter two, the focus is on, um, is, on the, is on the idea of negotiation. And so the chapter is an effort to queer Nollywood studies and to model ways of reading queer Nollywood films that does not discount their complexities in cultural context, but at the same time holds them accountable for participating in a public discourse that was supportive of the Same Sex Marriage Prohibition Act of 2014. So the first half of the chapter looks to the body of Nollywood films leading up to the, uh, the SSMPA, um, arguing that even though these films contradict state, state discourses that deny the existence of homosexuality, they also move and touch audiences by figuring the homosexual, the homosexual as an object of fear. Um, but in the second half of the chapter, um, and this is this was one of my this is one of my favorite to write actually. Um, the second half of the chapter, I look at Nollywood films produced by the Initiative for Equal Rights, which is a Lagos-based NGO, and discuss how queer activists have strategically used Nollywood aesthetics and conventions um, to touch audience emotions in ways that challenge the morality of homophobia itself. Um, here, I argue that tears practices what Obiyama Nepka calls nego feminism, which I have a feeling many of us are familiar with, um, a strategy that makes use of negotiation and give and take um, that is grounded in African values and morals. Um, so here are the films that, that, I, that I look at, um, and, I, and I went back to do you know, follow-up interviews um, with the directors of these films. So for, for people in the audience here who have done Nollywood film studies, you might, uh, might notice some of these directors' names. Um, the first they did was Color High Water, which is a 2016 film. It was a short and it's actually on YouTube. Um, and then they did a film called We Don't Live Here Anymore. Um, uh, Topo Yoshin, who did The Wedding, what, maybe The Wedding Party 2, I think, actually. We were just talking about The Wedding Party. Um, Walking with Shadows, um, which is an adaptation of a novel by Judea, the first um, queer not Afri uh, Nigerian novel. Um, which was public, I think the novel was published in 2005, but I, I might be wrong about that. And then it had a, um, uh, an Irish director, but it was produced by Funmi Ayanda, who's a, a, a big name in Nigeria, talk show host. Um, and so these are the three main films that Tears did, and they pulled Nollywood stars, Nollywood directors, Nollywood aesthetics. Um, and what they tried to do is kind of, is, 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 is Rather than making homosexuality seem immoral or problematic or, or antisocial, um, they really focus on homophobia and, and kind of examining, examining homophobia. Um, and actually, I'm going to play the trailer here. Sorry, it's a little hard because I can't see. There we go. Um, so this is the trailer from We Don't Do Anymore. I know what happened. It's your head. Head what? Vivian! I saw him was raped. No, no, no. Sorry, sorry. Please, can you say that again? I'm not sure I on. I'm sorry, can you repeat that? How do you do it, Mom? How do I do what? Act like everything is fine. That's all we've done. You don't have to back down every time someone pushes you. Sometimes you have to fight back. Sometimes you have to pick your buttons. We did what we had to do, Tolu. We're not bad people. Is that what you tell yourself? How dare you? Let me understand something. So in order to save your son's life, you're willing to ruin someone else's? This society, Tolu, they do not forgive boys like you! You think I chose this? I just wish you had told me. I thought I saw... You need a therapist right away. Why? We need to give it all the authenticity it requires. 
You are more worried about the damage that this will cause to your image than the fact that your son is sick. Our son, Femi. Our son. This time I can you. And then what next? She saw us. Moves us. Chidi and I. Chidi is a girl. Chidi is a boy. Look. So we can see the high and low dramatic stakes in here. The film really focuses on the moms um, and how they react to their two, their sons being caught together at school. Um, and it really is a condemnation of, in a way, how terribly they react and how they make the situation much worse. Um, it doesn't really focus on the, on the boys at all, their relationship, um, which I think is really interesting. Um, I, I just noticed the time, and so I'm gonna I'm gonna actually just kind of move through um, um, really quickly to talk about the the other two chapters, and I want to make sure we get time for for um, for Q and A. So the the third chapter is called "Cutting Masculinities: um, Post Apartheid South African Cinema," and um, so like the Nigeria chapter, it's got a more national focus. And what's what what's interesting about the forms of resistance in this in this chapter is that what seems to be resisted is I mean, yes, these are these are films that are, and as as we we probably know, South Africa has the most progressive um, constitution, right? Gay marriage was legal there before before it was here. Um, but what these films are really resisting is kind of this like this idea of the rainbow nation, this idea that like oh, it's all, everything's all good in South Africa. And so what's interesting is that these films, um, and they examine art films by. Um, by three male directors. Um, it's very hard for female directors to break into the scene um, in South Africa. Um, and so I, I discuss how these films, what, what's being resisted is kind of this like rosy rainbow nation vision. And so they wind up showing the way that race and sexuality and, and class kind of all, all, all um, kind of compound in, in post-apartheid South Africa. Um, again, I can talk about this film a little bit more uh, in the Q and A. Um, most, most often when I've done talks about this, I get the most questions on the South Africa chapter um, because um, that's what people are most, you know, kind of most familiar with. And for me, it was like, it, because my research had been on West Africa, to me, it was like the hardest one, the one to write in these, these talks and everybody wants to talk about the South Africa chapter. I'm like, can we talk about the Nigeria? Um, or, um, and the, the other film, how many people have seen Rafiki here? Okay, handful of people have seen Rafiki. Um, so the the last chapter, holding space, saving joy, um, is um, focuses on Wanyuri Kahu's Rafiki, and also um, a music video by um, an artist collective um, called Art Attack. And the the music video is a remix of the um, this the Macklemore and Ryan Lewis's song Same Love um, from 2012. Um, so in this in this uh, chapter I'm looking at what I call critical resistance. So I'm looking, uh, sorry, critical resilience. I'm looking at forms of resilience that also, um, to me, um, don't disavow vulnerability, that kind of keep it present. Um, and, um, and, and I'm looking at films that kind of um, have this like anticipatory hope. Um, I'll show you the the trailer for really quickly. Um, just to get a sense of the, I think this really, seeing this trailer next to the We Don't Live Here Anymore trail, trailer kind of shows the very different types of films that I'm looking at. Those are trying to give you like three, you know, three really different types of films. Let's make a pact that we will never be like any of them down there. Instead, we're gonna be something real. Yes, something real. Sing at the corn, me and Susie know. We ain't got no worries, we are looking like the odd. Now they can turn around. The police are going to attack. The Sako Bank, a mortgage. When we use the Vitamil diet, we use the Vitamil diet. Isn't she just look like a proper woman? Look at you. You're nothing. You know, exam results are out. I get to be a doctor. Yes. I can get a scholarship. Yes. Hi. 
wasiana wa MCA unadhani mama baba wanajua lakini kilicho nishangaza kuna wa Kenya ambao kidogo wanaishtumu serikali kwa sababu ya msimamo wao wa ndoa ya jinsia moja just a typical Kenyan girl. All right. Um, so I'll end just by saying, um, and this is, Rafiki really is the last film that I read. I read it within the context of some film festivals. Um, but thinking about critical resilience um, and the way that emphasizing sort of the complexities of, of inner life and what it means to really constantly every day have to resist um, the psychological like uh, weight of homophobia over, over and over again. So I think about resistance there. Um, and then I'll just read this last sentence. Um, is it, but my reading of Rafiki sees the film as one that is fused with anticipatory hope albeit one that is deeply intertwined with a vulnerability and wound woundedness it never tries to disavow or overcome. Um, so I think about Rafiki as kind of having this, it's got a, it's got a hopeful but not definitive ending. Um, and I, uh, I end the book by circling back to Dakan, the film from Guinea from 1997, um, and to talk about how the fact that these films which kind of bookend the project are really the only, um, the only, queer black African films that end with the possibility of the, of the couple um, having a, a happy ending. And in neither of these films is it definitive, actually. It's both like gestured to. So I talk about what that means and, and how all of these films really, um, they talk about homophobia, they talk about um, resisting homophobia, they talk about the triumphs and the um, possibilities and the joys and the love. And they also talk about all the hurdles and the obstacles. Um, so I'll end there so that we have time for, for Q&A.